Hello, everyone. All right, let's see here. Uh, they're on the sides. All right, good. So, uh, when the call for papers appeared, um, Lee Metcalf, who a colleague to you, some of you, uh, been involved in, in FIRST for a while, is at the CERT, uh, brought it to our attention. We had just completed um, a book, and we thought some of the material in this would be of interest to the group. Uh, this, I, I'm, I'm Gene Spafford. Um, Lee was going to be here speaking with me, uh, but she submitted her passport renewal eight weeks ago, indicated expedited, paid the extra fee, never showed up. And Josiah Dykstra, the third author uh, of this, was not able to get permission from his employer. Uh, Lee noted we're, we're all part of Patty Spafford, that's my wife, um, part of her entourage. She's the one who did all the illustrations for the book. Uh, she's here but not attending the conference. So let me see, how do I do the next slide? Is it the green arrow? There we go. Yes, so the idea behind this talk is when we deal with incident response, when we deal with the public, when we deal with try to educate people, um, we need to communicate. And communication is really important. That's a theme that we have behind the book is that very often our communications get muddied. We aren't always in agreement about what we say or what we're defining. In fact, one of the things that we wrote about at some length, there is no standard definition of cybersecurity. That when we talk about cybersecurity and we use that word, it actually means different things to different people. As you heard during the keynote, for instance, to some people like, like Leslie, cybersecurity also means an ICS environment. And in some environments, cybersecurity also means people and training. One of the areas where we communicate is we use analogies to try to describe elements of cybersecurity, uh, elements of cybersecurity to people who, oh, it's advancing on its own. Uh, it's a cybersecurity problem. I can't get it to stay there. Okay, well anyhow, we, we very often use analogies as a common way of teaching, of explaining things, and if we're not careful, some of those analogies can mislead and can actually obscure some of the, what we want to convey. Or we assume that we're conveying the appropriate message, but it actually isn't there. So. If we think about cybersecurity as a very broad field, it has really been in existence for about 60 years. Uh, I've been working in, in cybersecurity, not necessarily by that name, for 45 of those years, and seeing a number of changes in the technology, the terminology, the understanding. Uh, I was recently having a conversation with, some, with someone that, uh, cybersecurity when I was starting at the university. Uh, my apologies, I don't know why it's, why I'm struggling with this here. Um, that when I started in cybersecurity, um, uh, and now I can't get it to go backwards. There we go, well, all right, well, we'll see here. Um, when, I, when I really sort of started in cybersecurity as an academic discipline, because I'm an academic, there were many people who said, well, that isn't a subject area, it's just advanced system administration. If you, if you just knew how to program correctly and set passwords, security's all taken care of. Uh, and of course, we know that's not the case. And as time has gone on, the technology has gotten uh, more complex. We've had more layers to it. Uh, we've learned more things. Uh, 
Okay. We've learned more about uh, this. We've developed our own specialized technologies to deal with uh, networks, perimeter defense, intrinsic defense. We have malware we're concerned with, insiders, and so on. So we've developed a lot of concepts that we need to express to colleagues who work in the area, to people who are reporting incidents or trying to describe them, to management, to policymakers, and to others. And so having the right terminology and understanding how to present that is a really uh, key issue. So we use analogies in large part because we want to convey ideas to non-technical personnel. When we're dealing with technical items, we have technical terms. And we can use those terms and we can assume that they're standardized. And this is true in any discipline, not simply computing or cybersecurity, but medicine, engineering, politics, law. There are terms that are agreed upon within a field. We're still developing a lot of our terms. We're still in a position of trying to define what our field is. And as a result, we've developed and adopted a number of terms that are sort of borrowed from other places. And as a result, they're not always particularly precise. OK. So when we use those terms, they're fast. And we don't necessarily go into a lot of depth to explain the nuances of those terms. But it's a way of quickly conveying something. And I saw this 30 or yeah, about 35 years ago uh, when we started talking about computer viruses. Well, how do you describe what a computer virus is to a population that has no experience with malware? And we use the term virus, which is not a particularly precise term uh, in, in cyber. The problem is that when we use these kinds of analogies, when we do this kind of discussion, it leads to problems. And the problem is a, a sort of a slippery slope that when we use these terms, we know how we intend those terms to be interpreted, but how people actually interpret those are based on their own experience, their own viewpoint, and it may be different from ours. So we use those terms, we're talking to somebody, and they may nod their heads, and everything is fine. In fact, in many environments, you'll have people who don't want to admit that they don't understand. And this is often a case when you're dealing with acronyms as well in, in government settings and otherwise. People will just nod and pretend that they've got it, or they think they know what it is. But the, the result is that we've created a dissonance, a confusion, because we're really referring to things in a different way. This becomes even more pronounced when we look at an international population, such as represented by FIRST, where we have different native languages. And some of those analogies that we use, some of those terms, mean different things or have different origins within our native languages. And so if we are jointly speaking in English or French or Spanish, and we use some of those analogies, there's even further uh, difference in the underlying meaning of trying to translate from language to language and then from idiom to idiom. So some examples. <laughs> it's, it's an ICS problem. There we go. So uh, for example, there are legal analogies. And one of the most common is something that we've been saying we use as a term on a regular basis, where we say, our data has been stolen. All right, to us, we understand what that means. We understand that what that means is there has been unauthorized copying of our data. But to, certainly to a lawyer, for instance, the idea of stolen 
is very often the idea of larceny, where not only is it taken, but you deprive the rightful owner of their use of that item. So if I steal a car, I have taken the car, and I have prevented the legal owner from using the car. That's what stolen means to a, a lawyer. If we're talking about the general public, and we say, my data was stolen, then what they may think is that we have been deprived of use of that data. And therefore, it is more than simply a copying of intellectual property, but it is a deprivation of use. And so it may be, my research, it's gone, it's been taken, it's stolen. But those of us who work in the field don't view stolen data that way. We separate the idea of copying and destruction as two separate ideas, but the analogy of stolen doesn't have that difference in the general population. So that's a problem because people may react in a different way, particularly if we're talking to regulators. Now, things are better now than they used to be because many people who are involved in government and law are a little bit better understanding of what it means when data is stolen. But even so, some of them have that kind of misunderstanding of what it means when there's a criminal violation and theft. Military analogies. Um, something that's used, it's primarily US-centric. Uh, the idea that there was a cyber Pearl Harbor. Uh, this term has been around since the uh, 1980s and was used, uh, Win Schwerta was one of the first people to start using this term to talk about a catastrophe, a major national military catastrophe. And since then, uh, since the 80s when that was developed, we've also had talk about um, Cyber 9-11, which again is largely US centric and not necessarily. I, um, I was saying to someone, and I don't wanna go into depth on this, but when you talk about something being a cyber Pearl Harbor, it means something very different to, for instance, somebody in the US military versus perhaps somebody who's in the Japanese military. Um, it, it, it is intrinsically, it means something of uh, significance to relative to a, a, a real world event. We, we don't talk about a cyber Alamo or a, a, a cyber remember the main kind of thing or the Lusitania or uh, other kinds of analogies like this. But the intent of that is we're trying to get across the idea that it's a surprise, it's a disaster, it is a tactical and strategic defeat as a result of poor security. There are many people in military or quasi-military roles who get that idea that it comes out of nowhere, it's devastating, but it's viewed as an act of war. A lot of what we deal with at a nation state or a, when we're able to attribute to a nation state that are large scale cyber attacks are not elevated to the level of acts of war. There's some very interesting uh, recent, if, if you look at these kinds of things for policy, um, uh, Michael Fisher Keller is one of the people that uh, I, I talked to about this, the idea of persistent engagement, which is a level below actual conflict but ongoing international conflict tension that's going on. Using military analogies, and there are lots of other kinds of military analogies that we, that we might use about first strike, for instance, um, or, or uh, I've heard people talk about uh, uh, mil military uh, strategic weapons. They have meanings associated with them, and in particular, those of us who have not been Im in immersed in a military and a martial culture may assume we know what those terms mean, but they actually mean something very different to the people that we're talking about, uh, talking with. And so we have to be careful of those analogies. Medical analogies, and I mentioned the idea, well, our computer has a virus. Uh, in 
back in uh, 1988 when the Morris Internet worm hit and I was sort of on the front lines of that and, and responding, um, I would get phone calls from journalists who would ask what it was and said, you know, we heard it's a computer virus. And the term didn't originate. The, the term actually originated uh, from some science fiction literature back in the 19, early 1980s. And Fred Cohen popularized it with his, his uh, thesis research. But they would say, oh, this, this internet thing, this internet virus. And they would ask questions about it. And invariably, one of the questions is, do our readers have to worry about catching it? And the response would be, unless they're on the internet, their computers are fine. They said, no, not computers. How about uh, uh, people catching the virus? And being on the faculty at Purdue, I'd usually say, oh, I don't, you, you should talk to the folks at the IU Med School. Um, and, and so for those of you who know about Indiana. But the, the issue there is people think of it in terms of medic, medicine and what they're familiar with. One of the very first talks I was invited to give was at a conference at the National Institutes of Health to talk about computer viruses, which was an interesting experience. Um, but it's, it's a disconnect if we use those terms. We talk about worms. We, talk, we, we used to use terms like rabbits uh, as an, or bacteria as other kinds of malware. And those don't really lend clarity. They actually lend confusion depending on the audience we're talking to. We use a lot of physical world analogies where we talk about firewalls and protecting the walls around a castle or we, we talk about a moat and so when we say cybersecurity is like defending a castle and we have to pull up the walls and guard, guard the entrances, um, what, what people hear from that who don't understand is, well, if we do that, we've sort of set ourselves in a position we can see the attackers coming. And that's seldom the case. Um, and furthermore, it gives the idea that we establish some kind of moat with protections. And as long as we keep those things out, those attackers out, we see them coming, our systems are protected. It totally leaves out ideas of uh, defects in the systems, supply chain issues, insider uh, attacks, and so on, because the analogy of what a castle wall and a moat is obscures really what the security picture is about. So when we use these kinds of analogies to explain to novices and to the public, we're actually doing them a disservice because it means that they aren't really understanding the totality, the scope of how they can be attacked. A big one that goes on, that's going on now in several countries is we talk about cryptography and we talk about keys and we talk about locks and we say, well, cryptography is like a lock and we do the lock on the data. And what people hear is, well, locks can be picked, and there are skeleton keys, and we'll just deposit a key with the government, and everybody will, and everything works. Again, by choice of words and the way we're using analogies, how people understand locks and keys does not match how they're actually done in an electronic, in a digital realm, and it creates expectations that are incorrect and can be damaging. We're seeing some real problems with policy formation right now by those in government who believe, because we talk about keys and we talk about electronic locks, that they can somehow mandate that those locks be decrypted, that their keys be available so that they can gain access to the contents when they need to. And it doesn't work like that. At trying to explain that, has turned out to be very challenging because we've created these expectations. So to sum up here quickly, there's a lot more, um, but it's really important that you understand your audience. What is it that your audience understands about the technology? When you use these words, when you use these descriptions, what background do they have? Uh, what is it that they actually do understand? What is their native language? 
Second, you need to refine your message. Be sure that if you're trying to convey nuance, that you're explicit about it rather than implying it. That if you are implying some of these issues, they're likely to be misunderstood. It's also the case, as I encourage all of you, if you think about when you write advisories, when you write any kind of guidance for how to protect systems, think about are you implying knowledge that readers may not have or that is likely to change as the technology evolves? Because again, you're creating this kind of impression that may give wrong results. And then the third part of that is in recognizing that you are a respected source of information. And that when you use these words, people are going to want to quote you. They're going to want to cite you as a reference. So it's very important that you get it right the first time rather than going, deciding you're going to go back later and clean it up because your words will carry and the documentation you write will continue to be used and you may create the wrong impressions and it's very difficult then to come back and clear them up, such as computer viruses. Yes. So, the takeaway from this, this little bit, is one of the things that we were looking at as we, as we went through and, and tried to look at common myths and, and uh, misconceptions, is it's really important that you think about your audience and the message you're trying to convey and how you should be precise rather than just pick analogies. Because if we're going to make progress, if we're going to get the general public as part of what we're doing, and we need to, we need to have everybody involved in, in cybersecurity. It's not us and them, it's us. Then we have to be precise in our communications. That means that you have to understand who you're talking to. It's not simply your peer group. It's not simply other people who work on the technology. It's everybody else. It's the people who you, who you meet who you know, maybe paint your houses or drive taxis or help uh, check out your, your goods at the store. All of those people are your audience, and so you need to think about how you talk to them. Um, I'm going to uh, stop here and take some questions. I put contact information down there, including an email address, and if uh, any of you uh, identify some really good cyber myths or miscommunications that we didn't cover in, in the book or that I didn't cover in the talk, we'd love to hear about them. And with that, I will take some questions. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Now, the, uh, we have almost 10 minutes for the question and answers. And there are three microphones at each row. So if you could line up either of the microphone for the question, uh, that would be great. Ah, well-known troublemaker to start. Uh, Tom? Hey, Spap. Thank you much. Great, great presentation. Um, one of the things, I know you talk a lot about talking to non-expert communities using these analogies. Can you reflect for a minute on the way that we use the analogies in the expert community and overuse them such that they actually drive research areas? So, for example, escrow keys, you could argue, actually came from a first bad analogy, and then that created mathematical research. It ended up the way it was so that these become a term of art as opposed to an analogy for the public. Can you reflect on that a little bit? Um, that's part of, I, I think that's a great observation and that's part of what I was saying about we have to be careful about being precise to begin with. Um, we use terms in publications, for instance. Virus is one of them. Firewall is another one, is, is a classic example. Uh, where the idea of a firewall is really fire prevention. It's used to prevent the spread of flames. And if you think about where firewalls have evolved, they include IDS, they include logging, they include uh, DNS black holing, they, you know, all kinds of other things. Um, the term has driven some of our development of this. Even in the area, and, 
and I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of, of some of what uh, uh, Leslie was talking about earlier, OT technology. When we talk about cybersecurity, our notion of what cybersecurity is has left out some of the issues having to deal with open technology because we haven't been explicit about what that involves. Um, I would say if we were to ask everyone to come up with a definition of cybersecurity, we would have you know, maybe 60 different ones here in the room. And that's part of the problem is that we use these terms, we embed them, we assume that everybody knows what they are, even in the research literature. And, and as a result, we aren't exploring all the things that we might best be developing. So it was a great point. I don't know if I addressed it directly, but yeah. Sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, in your work uh, developing your book or just in general, do you have a preferred uh, taxonomy or reference for the terminology that we use in our profession? Um, there's been some effort to standardize on terminology through uh, NIST, ISO, IEEE. This is part of the problem though, is that there's no one set of definitions that everybody uh, agrees with. And um, it makes things difficult. Part of, the, part of the problem by not having standard definitions, for instance, is we don't have standard metrics. And without metrics, it's very difficult to compare things. So a lot of what we do, we talk about an improvement, but how do we measure it? What are we going to do with it? Um, Norm Augustine, who was a famous software engineer, uh, was once talking about software engineering, but I think his comment fits for cyber. He said that at this point in the development of civil engineering, they hadn't even invented the right triangle. And that's kind of where we are. We're not yet at the point where we have formalized this enough as a field. As a, it, it's only 50 years old, really, and there are many people who still think it's just glorified system administration. So those of us who work in the field knew, need to do a better job of, for instance, when we use the word cyber, indicate what our source is for that definition. And for the moment, I would just say, uh, I'll defer to NIST. Uh, for the moment, although NIST has three published definitions and they don't match. So hopefully that addresses that. Over here, sir. Thanks, Beth. Uh, great talk. Uh, great to see you again. Um, comment and question. Um, you asked for analogies. Here's one that I've used many times is the Red Queen effect. Right? I actually lobbied to have that put in front of a book I wrote about 10 years ago. And what I think I heard from your talk today is one of the things we should do, we can use analogies but we should always clarify for our audience what aspect of that analogy we mean to convey and maybe what we don't, right? I've found them very really powerful, but even amongst experts, like I'll be, I was talking to a guy last week, I was like, we should do blank, it, the, the topic doesn't even matter. He's like, no, we shouldn't do that at all. I'm like, okay, this is what I meant to say, right? And this is the component of the analogy I tried to convey. And he's like, oh yeah, you should totally do that. I'm like, thank you. Right, so is that one of the things we should take away from here is, is we can use analogies, but after that we should always follow with the clarifying statements of, you know, what, I, what nuance did we mean to convey and what, did, what didn't we? Um, it, it's hard to make a sweeping generalization, but y yes, if we use analogies, we should be more precise. I, I believe that one of the better places to use analogies is in explaining a more precise concept. So, um, for instance, and I'll, I'll reduce this to the way we very often teach children to acquire language and understanding of the world, is if they see um, a horse for the first time, but they've had experience with dogs, you don't say, it's a dog, but actually not, it's got these other features, which is where you would use the analogy and then do the specification. Really what you should do in teaching is say, that's a horse, it's a little like a dog, but it has these other features. And I, I admit that's a very, very trivialized example, 
But as we explain things, if we're going to use analogies, the analogies should be to clarify, not to substitute for the initial uh, explanation and the initial identification. Uh, and that, that's challenging. I, I'm saying that as a professional educator. And so that's more natural to me to how to explain things is, is to use the terms and then use the analogies to clarify. Thank you. OK. I think we have time for another couple here. Okay. Thanks a lot. Really enjoyed the book. But we clearly not the only community that uses analogies. And so my question would be is how can we become better and actually understand other people's analogy? And can this help us creating better ones? Um, so there was a little bit of an echo. I wasn't quite sure what you said, but you said how can we get better so, at understanding the text? So we're not the only ones that use analogies. For example, Medical doctors tend to use oh, analogies. Sure. How can we become better at understanding analogies and don't kind of project too much into it? And can this help us creating better analogies from ourselves? Um, thinking by analogy is, is something that seems to be intrinsic to human nature to be able to, to understand concepts. It's, it's a standard way of acquiring knowledge. So getting better at it is probably helpful for, for us in many different fields. Uh, the way to combat misleading analogies is to be more mindful of where we use them. And in particular, if there's something new that we want to describe, is don't resort to an analogy as the first thing that we're going to describe. Um, so as, as an example, uh, some of the attacks that have been committed against infrastructure. Um, we shouldn't start off by saying, think of it as a computer worm, except it operates on OT systems and the, powers, the power grid. It, it's much better to think about carefully, how are we going to define it in the first instance uh, for doing that? I don't know if this is directly addressing your, your question. Getting better at understanding analogies is in part by increasing our vocabulary and the precision with which we use it. Um, and that's a challenge in an international audience as well, where we don't necessarily have the shared vocabulary. Uh, a second thing I'll mention that's, that's also useful is referring back to authoritative references like NIST or ISO. So when we use a term, let's define it back. So if there's any question, people can go look at that. That's another thing. Um, medical doctors do that. They refer back to published literature. They publish, publish textbooks. So I think that would be the answer I'd give. All right. Um, you got one more? Oh, oh. I'm sorry. It's time. OK. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to stop you, but this is my duty. <laughs> All good. Are you, are you staying here today? Or uh, I am going to be here today uh, for most of the day, oh, of the but day. I'm not going to be here the rest of the week. So if you want to catch me, today's the day. Yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Stafford, for your great presentation. <laughs>